Well, good morning, everybody. It is. Good morning. It is a good morning. We got some snow out there a little bit. Not much. We're uh, sorry to hear about Ben being sick, not feeling good. Let's go to the Lord right now in prayer. Because there are many people that need to be lifted up in prayer. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, help us. Guide us. Lead us. We pray for Ben and his healing and Kathy. She isn't here today because uh, a food-like uh, symptom is happening. But we look to you. We come to you in prayer. As my friend Mike has told me, prayer availeth much. We don't give honor to COVID. We don't give honor to the flu. We know about the spike protein. We know about nanotechnology. We know about all the evil that man has gotten into, but we look to you. We believe you have pow power over this so-called flu, this man-made genetic altered substance. So we look to you to help us, lead us, and guide us. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to first of all thank all of you for your cards and letters. We greatly appreciate hearing from you, even though I'm not able to respond these days like I used to. Um, but we love hearing from you and really appreciate it. Uh, this week, for instance, we were sent some pictures of a family. Loved it. They're out of Wisconsin. And uh, the family photos were really good. They uh, told me a lot about the family. But uh, we need to communicate with one another. We need to stay in touch. And... Uh, Many of you are making that effort. Many of you are reaching out to other people in prayer these days. We all need prayer. Prayer for ourselves. Prayer for our families. In many ways. But uh, this man who's a farmer in Wisconsin, he's... Uh, Got a very nice family. And I appreciated the pictures. And what he had to say lifted me up. Many of you have a profound effect upon us here and help keep us going. So right now I just want to again say thank you. Um, when I saw these photos, I was remembering when I was very little, 
young, I was a Cub Scout. And I had a uh, young man my age and his dad invited the Cub Scouts over to visit the family farm. Yes, he had a, a modest house in town, but he had a family farm, and they always work, uh, stayed steady in working on the farm. He was a tough guy. Can you imagine eating back in the 50s real milk, drinking real milk and having real cream and uh, butchering uh, uncontaminated cows and stuff like that. He was a real strong guy too. He could lift those square bays of hell of uh, hay, and uh, he w he could do pretty good on those. And this is a little guy, but he grew very strong. You didn't want to fight him. He was a quiet guy, but if you pushed him too much. He would come out swinging with both hands, and you didn't want to get in his way. He was an ox. But he, I don't know how long they had the family farm. It was quite a little while. But you don't see that today, do you? Very much. There's lots of reasons because of that. But they wanted this family held on to this farm and kept their uh, this farm going for lots of various reasons. But they had family values and commitment. And there was a Anglo-cultural thing going on way back then. By the way, this is a German family. Good workers. Today, first of all, I say thank God for that family. Where is that family today? You say, oh, they're still out there. Not. Not as much. They don't have that commitment. And the cities and the city life and the worldly appeal, the government and other institutions are yielding that. God help us. Drive us back to family values. Family restoration, as we one time had in America. God can do this. God can change a lot of things, especially through the power of prayer. We all need prayer. But God drove me out of the city. San Antonio, Phoenix, and my wife and I came out of the city life. We could see the corruption that was taking place and the warping of worldly values. To a community of fear that though it's not perfect, still has in the uh, county a lot of Christian values to a degree. They may be Judeo-Christian, obviously, but they are 
to some degree, a large degree, Christian. That's why in town here they're trying to change the vote as liberal as they can get it. But it's stuck. It sticks in the county where it's still more conservative. And there are, the uh, liberals are a little worried about that. In Seattle area, as an example, the bill still goes out to the homosexuals and God knows what else out there. But that's changing even to a degree. And we thank God for that. Patty Murray's a little bit worried about that these days. I hope it works out. I know there's still corruption at the voting booth and other things. Anyway, we're going to learn about in this study on women and their role. I don't worry some of you. Oh, my God. We're talking about women? Yes, women. I don't think that subject has been dealt with fully. Oh, yes, we know the usual outcry, as though we're not aware of it. We've been aware of these things for years, decades. But we need to go back and scrutinize what the Bible really says about this issue. Because there's a lot that has not been said or told because of fear of this, fear of that. Let's not be fearful. Let's look at it. Look at the hard realities, what the Bible really says. Amen? Amen. All right, good morning. Like Pastor Dave said, we're going to get on to part two, woman, doormat, or disciple. This will be uh, more than two parts at least, because I know we're going to have at least three, maybe four. It's not an easy subject, I'm sure as you all know. Uh, there are a lot of people that have been, um, well, I've gotten some responses and some emails and texts and things about this sermon, and some people are all up in arms that... Uh, you know, this is being preached this way or that. Well, we're not through the series yet, so I'd say before you start jumping at conclusions or jumping the gun, give the series a chance. And uh, Pastor Dave's always said this. Don't listen to just one part, draw conclusions, and don't listen to the rest because it's an easy way to find yourself confused or um, having the answer you want to see be the answer that you want to have found one way or the other. So yes, there is. Um, I am aware that uh, Matt Dyer put out a survey on Christian America Ministries, and it says, do you believe the Bible teaches that women should be pastors and preachers? If so, why? And then, of course, it's a multiple cho choice answer. No, but they can teach other women. Or yes, I believe women can be pastors. And then, of course, number three, just show me the results. But um, so I'm sure this is going out because people have heard me preach and they've gone around telling everybody else, Pastor Reed's about to ordain women or something. Now, uh, interesting about this survey, though, is it says, do you think they can be pastors and preachers? And then, of course, the answers jump down to teach. So you see, we're going to have to do some definitions of terms, I see, because I don't know what they consider a pastor. I don't know what they consider a preacher, and I don't, consider what they, and I don't know what they consider a teacher. So we'll have to get down to that, and we'll cover that in this series. But um, to get any kind of accuracy about the, uh, that survey, we're going to have to have some definitions of terms first. Then we'll have to see what the Bible says, and um, you can answer that whichever way you want right now, but um, finding out whether or not that answer is biblical, we'll have to wait. 
So we're going to review real quick with 1 Corinthians 11.3. We went over this last week. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So once again, this is God's creative order. This would be God, Christ, man, woman. And then, of course, man and woman married, children. And of course, children, they are subject to, or they must submit to, the authority of those parents that God has placed over them. And very quickly, we'll see that this is a part of the submission as far as law is concerned. We'll see what it is God has to say about parents. Since marriage and the rearing of children is an institution put forth by God, we'll have to see what he has spelled out for us in the law. We'll go to Deuteronomy 21. We'll see what that says. Deuteronomy 21, 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, he will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of this city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This is our son. He is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of this city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you, and Israel shall hear and fear. So you see the power these parents have over children. If you have an incorrigible child, you can take him to the elders and put him to death. If he will not hearken to mom or dad. And then, of course, the result of that is that we will put evil away from among us, so we execute them. And then, of course, the deterrent here is that Israel shall hear and fear. And what a great warning to have to another child who saw that, you know, if you don't listen to mom or dad. Now, this is, this is a case of continual, habitual sin. This is not just somebody misbehaving or a boy being a boy. This is an incorrigible child that won't hear. Notice here, he's a glutton and a drunkard. So we see that this is, um, and this does happen. Now, look at Luke 2. There's another case of parents. I know we're stepping off man and woman, but I want you to see the institution of marriage and man and wife that God has put forth. Luke 2, go to 40. And the child grew, Jesus, and walked wet strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was put upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days... As they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So they left Jesus behind after they left town. But they, supposing him to be in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him after their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the midst of the doctors, sitting, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I would must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. So even Jesus subjected himself to his earthly parents. Now, number five in the top ten is honor your father and mother, children. Of course, Paul refers to it as the first covenant with promise. Uh, Exodus, that would be Exodus twenty twelve. honor your father and mother. Now, if parents have such great power, then it must be said, with great power comes great responsibility. And of course, God understands that the responsibility of parents in this earth, on this earth now, is to raise the future of Israel. And we'll learn more about what it is parents are supposed to be seen doing. And we understand that the man and wife is a unit put forth by God. And that unit, of course, has God's order within it. So if you confound God's chain of command in any way, you've not only confounded his house, but your house, and it's led to rebellious, gluttonous, drunkard children who have then coursed to save us from the trouble or to be put to death immediately. But I digress. 
God does take the role of man and woman very seriously. Anyway, back to 1 Corinthians 11.7. Now, this is talking about head coverings, which we're not going to get into this week, but we will cover because it's a very important point. And, of course, we all understand that um, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, these are always uh, verses that are brought up whenever we're talking about women. Now, this is head coverings, and we will get into this in great depth, but not this week. Just in passing... 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. So the woman is the glory of man. 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So we understand this is what we said last week about God's creative order once again, that without uh, man is not made for woman, yet without her, man is alone and incomplete. These are the verses that state this. And woman was made for man, yet yet she alone can complete him. She is the glory of man. So it's a very important thing. We're not to put women down or to make them something that they're not. Now, last week we dipped into 1 Timothy a little bit, and I said that when you preach 1 Timothy chapter 2 in error, it leads to uh, grievances between your wife, you, and, of course, how the home is to be run. So the theme of 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, that's about prayer in church. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15, of course, is about the role of women in spiritual leadership. Just so we know, that's what 1 Timothy 2 is about. So, and all, and all that is about conduct in the church or the place where God tabernacles or dwells. So it's about contact, conduct um, in God's house. We'll read 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So that word teach there we will get into later. So women, according to this, cannot teach. And then, of course, that's uh, like the survey we read earlier and everything else. So since women can't teach, that means nothing about anything to anybody, but apparently it's just fine that they can teach to women and children only. And we'll have to see if this pans out and harmonizes with the rest of the Bible later. But according to verse 13 and 14, when people state that women cannot teach, they cannot be seen saying anything at all, they'll use this verse here, and then they'll back it up with verse 13 and 14. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So they'll say, no, women can't teach. They're not to be seen opening their mouths in public at all. because And then they'll quote God's creative order when it's convenient here for them that Adam was created first, so then Eve can't teach. And since Eve's capable of sin, Eve can't teach. I understand this is starting to make for a very ridiculous argument, and we will get to it. But for right now, let me inform you. I did listen to Pastor John Weaver's uh, sermon in its entirety before I ever put pen to paper on the first notes or sermon notes of this series, just for the benefit of the audience out there. Pastor John Weaver's sermon I listened to line by line. I went through a transcript of it, made my own notes. It ended up being seven pages of notes from John Weaver's sermon concerning this, which is not a YouTube video. It's found on sermonaudio.com. Actually, Matt Dyer's the one that threw me the link. So last week's sermon was almost exclusively from the pages of notes I took from John Weaver. So I'll say if you disagreed with my last week's sermon or were confused about it, it's because you were confused about John Weaver in the first place because that's where I got my notes. And John Weaver does make quite a case. So we will visit the woman teaching role later. 1 Timothy 2, 8. I will therefore that man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So men lead prayer in church. The word men here is from the Greek word andros, which is a nominative plural for masculine or male, biological gender. Let's get this straight now. So the word men here in verse 8 means men in the light of their biology 
or gender. It does not mean mankind in general. And I know it seems like we're cutting a fine line here, but that will matter as we go into this series, because like I said, we need to determine uh, word definitions first. So this is men here as opposed to boys, and it's men here as opposed to women. So men pray. So according to 1 Timothy 2.8, this is God's will for men concerning prayer in church. Verse 9, And in like manner also, that women adore themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. We'll get into broidered hair later. But here, again, woman here is from the Greek gynaikos. That's G-Y-N. So we get our word gyno, O-B-G-Y-Ns, things like that. This is all feminine. And so it's the nominative plural for feminine, female. So biological females, woman or womankind. God's will for women in church is this. According to verse 9, women only, God's will in church is to dress modestly, live holy lives, and learn in subjection. 1 Timothy 3, now, the theme. So by the time you read through chapter 2 in 1 Timothy, you get to chapter 3. Now this is a pastoral epistle written from Paul to an aspiring bishop, Timothy. And uh, Paul's here in chapter 3 is concluding his statements made concerning church structure and conduct. And uh, this chapter is less broad because what it does is it deals specifically with the qualifications for elders, leaders, and deacons. So 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, verse 1. This is true saying that if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So according to verse 1, being a bishop is good work. We're going to go through one of these, each one, one by one. Make sure we're not skipping anything. You follow along. Make sure Pastor Reed isn't cheating you. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So a bishop is married to one wife, of a temperate mind, sober, well-behaved, hospitable, kind-hearted, generous, and an able teacher. Can we agree with that? That's right. I didn't add anything. Verse 4, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So he's the head of his home and the one who runs it and manages it in accordance with God's will and law. Now remember, to be the head of the house, your home, not God's house, your home, your domicile, your habitat. To be the head of it, you must be both the physical head and the spiritual head. There is no such thing as just being one or the other. So I I actually have run into this. I have people in my own life that I know personally whose wife agrees they can be the spiritual head. But that's it. Now how how you make a decision, how would you say that this is what God says and then go about putting that into action if only uh, you've been given the glass ceiling of being the spiritual head only? I, I, I don't know. So we understand to be the head of your home, you must be the spiritual head and the head. And of course, you're only going to get that from the Bible's instruction anyway. Verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So if a man cannot meet the parameters of verse 4, he is obviously disqualified from being a pastor, bishop. Even, I would have to ask, even if he is one already, Remember, because you have to what? We've talked this before. You have to practice what you preach. We'll see if our Lord had anything to say about that. Matthew 23, verse 2. This is where Paul's getting this, I would bet. Saying the scribes, and the scribes this Jesus, saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So here are people who are the religious leaders, the handlers of the law. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Do not say something and do the opposite. Look at verse 28. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The word iniquity could mean sin. So here is, remember, practice what you preach. This would be... When I think of that, I'll come to another verse, too. We'll go to Matthew 7. What is it about these pastors that say one thing behind the pulpit and then do opposite in their own private lives? 
Matthew 7, verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? O oh, how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. This must obviously have to apply to people who are to handle God's word, handle God's law, and do what? Well, in the world we're saying here, what Jesus understood, what we read into Timothy is, lead by example, practice what you preach. I would say if we consolidated these verses from Jesus and then considered them in the light of bishop and pastor, I could say, if you don't lead by example or practice what you preach, and you go about preaching the word in error, and then you go about running your home after the manner in which you preach the word, you've disqualified yourself because Verse 5 and um, 1 Timothy 3 would then apply to you. So what I'm saying is, if you're up there preaching it wrong, and then in so doing you practice what you preach at the house, and that's all out of order in God's Bible, then you're not a pastor, even if you call yourself one. You've just preached yourself out of a job by confounding practice what you preach and trying to pull moats out of other people's eyes or get their homes in order, while you yourself don't even know what a uh, home in order looks like because you refuse to read the law or teach it. So notice in 1 Timothy verse ch uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, are all addressed and can only be applied to men. I would say it'd be fairly difficult for a woman to be the man of one wife. So there's that. We cannot step off what the Bible says here, Otherwise, we're like the fundamentalists and everybody else that lies about what the Bible has to say. So we must know that it has to be men. And of course, the Bible doesn't confuse gender, and neither do we. It's only Babylon and her adherents that would cause such chaos when it comes to defining what a man and woman are biologically. And you know, this is the world we live in now where they cannot decide what a man or woman is any longer. So we can conclude that according to the Bible... Women, woman cannot be named as head of a household. Women cannot be named as head of a church or the house of God. Now, can they learn all they can about God in his Bible? Yes. Can they then apply that knowledge in their lives? Yes. Remember last week, can you join the cause, fight the good fight? Can women do this? Yes. Can they receive training? Yes. Can they raise their right hand for God and his cause in front of witnesses? Yes. Can you be an infantryman? Can you be on the front lines as a woman? No. No, you cannot be. Most women wouldn't want that anyway because they understand the honor it is to be a woman. Can they still be effective riflemen without being front linesmen? Yes. So what is all this biblically? Raising your right hand, right? We know what we're talking about in the service. United States Code, Title 10, Section 502. This is the oath we take. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. If you served in any branch of the military from May 5th, 1950 to today, you've said that oath. George, you remember it? Pastor Dave, you remember that one? Well, I took it. Now, is there a biblical equivalent of this? Is there a biblical equivalent of love this oath? Exodus 19 We'll see if there is such a thing, because this, this is going to feel like we're stepping off the rails here, but I'm making a case, so bear with me. Exodus 19, verse 3, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, so here's who's being addressed, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. Now, notice, who is this that's going to be a peculiar treasure? Well, verse 3, Jacob, 
the children of Israel. Verse 6, And ye, Jacob, shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came down and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And here's the people's response. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Did they really mean that? The Bible has a law called the law of two witnesses. Let's see if Israel agreed to it again. We'll go to Exodus 24 this time, a few pages over. Several speeches about the law later. Moses again Verse 1, And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou, and Aaron, and Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told all the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. So at least twice, in Exodus alone, we have Israel agreeing to the law and serving God. So what happened? Israel told Is- Moses told Israel the terms of this covenant, which was this. If you keep God's law, then you will be his nation, his children, his royal priesthood, his chosen people, and his wife. To enlist into the cause, God's cause, that's the kingdom, Israel, men and women, had to swear or affirm, in other words, vow or give their word that they would, as a matter of duty, support and uphold God's law against all peoples and nations, both foreign and domestic, which we have done, which we did, that they would bear faith and allegiance to the same, same what? The laws and ways of God that they would obey the lawful orders of God. Now remember, God cannot ever issue us an unlawful order. It would confound his perfect justness. And God is our commander-in-chief and his appointed or ordained officers, all in accordance to the written word as a witness. What was Israel's response to this contract? Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Now, is this the response of true Israel today? Absolutely not. Does this bar them from enlisting? Yes. Yes, it does. Do they still go around saying they've served? Yes, they do. Now, we have a a term for that that's called stolen valor. That's a lie. Will God honor that? No. Well, we better check with him. I don't want you to take my word for it. Back to Matthew 7. We'll see if God honors people who say they serve him, people who say they've served him the kingdom and his cause and obey the law. Verse, uh, uh, Matthew, 7, chapter, or ver, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And the will of God is that we obey his commandments. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And I will then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So yes, if you claim to be an enlisted service member for the cause of God's kingdom, and you don't, and you're not one, you confound his law, well, you've broken the oath or contract that God put forth all the way back here in Deuteronomy and Exodus to us. You're to uphold that and abide by that covenant if you obey my law. Now, it doesn't seem to have a bearing on one's gender here either. Did Israel publicly, or at least in front of two witnesses or more, make this affirmation? Did they raise their right hand? Did they do this back in the old law? As a, what is it that's a token of the old covenant? What proof did Israelites have back then that they took this oath? Well, let's go to Genesis 17. This is 17. If you hit the table of contents, you've gone too far. 
This is 17. Now, this is Abraham. This would be the Abrahamic covenant. Now, watch these words. Verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore thou and thy seed after thee in thy generations." This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed. After thee, every child among you shall be circumcised, and that ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And of course, here you watch that word everlasting. Here it means age long, in case you're confused while we're still not living in Canaan land. So circumcision is a token of the covenant, of the Abrahamic covenant, which is what? Well, being a child of God. Now notice here over in 15, verse 15, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. So apparently, the woman would go by a new name as well. If we go all the way through, and we're skipping ahead a bit, if we go into end time prophecy, the woman's new name would of course be Daughters of the King. Now, back to Exodus 12. We're looking for tokens of the covenant very quickly so we can get this straight in our mind. Women, disciple or doormat. Let's see if we can figure this out. Exodus 12, go to verse 12. This would be the Passover. And the blood shall, I'm sorry, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, and I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So another token here was who? Well, those who dwelt in Goshen, or the land of Israel believers are protected by God. Well, protected from what? Well, if you go to verse 23, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. So, we're protected from what? Well, if it was God that sent the destroyer, then we must be, as Israelites, protected from God's wrath. You see, here in the kingdom ministry here, we do not pray for protection from the devil, do we? We pray to be spared from God's wrath on that day, the day of the Lord, which you can read all about in Joel 2 and Amos 5. Most end-time prophecy really has something to do with the end time day of the Lord because it's all one future. It's all ever one future. Anyway, the token here is perfection, protection from God as Israelite believers. The word token here is from the Hebrew 2.26, meaning a signal, sign, monument, memorial, a mark. Exodus 13, one chapter over, verse 12, and thou set thy, that thou set that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that opened the matrix. That word matrix there is translated womb. And every firstling that cometh out of a beast which thou hast in the male shall be the Lord's. Now this is, of course, implicates the law of the firstborn. And this will eventually, we talked about this in the tithe sermon, this will eventually be the law of tents and what it is we dedicate to the Lord as his people. You notice here opening the matrix. 13. Now we'll go to 14, and it shall be when thy son asketh thee in the time to come, saying, What is this that thou say unto him? By strength of hand the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both firstborn of man and beast, the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem, and it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So another token or sign of the covenant, what covenant? The old covenant God cut with us here 
is specifically talking about the law of the firstborn and eventually the law of tens. Of course, we observe the law of God. These are tokens or marks. We teach our children about God and his covenants with us. And we always keep our oath in the forefront of our minds. That's a mark of Israel or a token of the covenant we have. So there are tokens of the covenant, but what about raising our right hand? We said, yes, you raise your right hand, you agree to what it is God says. Well, what is that? What's the physical act we do? Mark 1. We're going to see if this applies to women at all. At all, at all. Or does it exclude them? Mark 1. Because women are very valuable in God's eyes, and if they are to him, we should be the same persuasion. And Mark 1, 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Mark 20, uh, Matthew 28, just look over there to your left. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Howard Rand and Farrar Fenton agree, it should be written, I am with you to the end of the age. Matthew 10. Thirty-two. Whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So, what's going on here? We are baptized in water to show what? Well, that we are indeed disciples and we follow after Christ's example. We demonstrate our changed life. And we declare this commitment publicly, do we not? So if we're to enlist for the kingdom cause, we do what? How do we do this? Well, number one, we agree to God's terms as outlined by his code of conduct and regulations. That's this book here that would also be called a FM or TM, Technical Manual, Field Manual, showing a physical act of obedience in baptism, raising our right hand, that's physical, which symbolizes what? Our death to sin, the burial of our old lives, and the new mission or walk of life as resurrected kingdom citizens. Bearing tokens of our oath to live and serve the king look like what nowadays? Dedicating ourselves and our children to the teaching and learning of his laws, statutes, and judgments, along with the history of being his people and his nation, we bear the token by having the perfect protection and blessing of God, and we bear the circumcision as token. Now wait. Now you've got me, I know. Wait, Reed. That's only men that can be circumcised, right? We talked about that in the law. So the kingdom is just full of resurrected men then. I guess Ruth and Esther and the rest of the great women of the Old Testament missed out because after all, women can't be circumcised. Can they? Romans 2. Can women bear the mark of circumcision? Women to, uh, Romans 2, verse 28. I read, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, Judean, or of the southern kingdom of Judah. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Okay, so a disciple can be either a man or woman who has a circumcised heart. There's a token when we can bear. What is a circumcised heart? Well, that comes from the Latin circumcise. That'd be sir, come, around. We got a word circumference. And then, of course, the Latin k dare, to cut to hew, to fell, to cut down, to beat. Followed around the lit Latin, and this is just a side bar for you, but I think it's interesting to learn, so I'll help you guys along. Follow around the Latin, we'll come to cado, which is where we get our end suffix side, C-I-D-E, cado, which means to fall. Homicide, man falls. 
regicide, king falls. To decide, to fall upon a choice. And that's interesting, isn't it? And then KD is a fallen body. That's where we get our word corpse or cadaver, a body ready to be cut. And then casus, of course, is feminine. And you get our word caesarian or caesarian, like this caesarian section or a C section, a cut given during birth. The male form of casus is casis, which is where we eventually get our words like chisel, a cutting tool, or incision to make a cut. Anyway. To circumcise is to cut around, trim, clip, or prune off and around. What's Paul talking about here? Where did he get this idea? No foreskins anymore. We do uh, hearts. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, 31. And those should be very famous verses. I shouldn't even have to turn here. I should have these memorized by now. I do, but for the benefit of you all, read them. 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Notice that repetition again. God's power, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. To who? That was to Jacob, the house of Israel. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and they shall be, and I and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Two witnesses always. Did God mean what he said? Ezekiel 36. This must have been what Paul was familiar with. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, I read. Sorry, I skipped the page. 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my judgments, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Obviously, this has several implications in end time prophecy. But a circumcised heart is to be found within God's people who have his protection living in a land he's given them. These are marks of Israel. A circumcised heart, then, is one that has been newly formed and conditioned after the old way of sin and Babylon has been cut away from it in, area, in every area of our lives or all the way around. Well, that's the Old and New Covenant, and they both apply to any Israelite who would join the cause or fight the good fight. So it's the Old and New, the New Covenant, of course, is mentioned in Hebrews 8. You guys know this as well, very quickly. Hebrews 8, what? 6. Now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much he is the mediator of a better covenant, that's Jesus we're talking about, which was established upon better promises, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then shall no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, who? The people whom the first covenant was made, Jacob, Israel. Notice the fault here in the old covenant wasn't with the covenant or the law itself. No need to put that away. It was the people who couldn't abide by it perfectly, which is what the law requires. Finding fault with them, Jacob, Israel, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So here's the terms made with these two people between God himself. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So the writer of Hebrews here, of course, is quoting directly what we read from the old covenant. It goes word for word if you turn to the Septuagint, by the way. So this applies to the who? Well, this letter here is written to the Hebrews. But what do the old Hebrews have to do with Jesus? And why is this letter even in the New Testament if it's written to these old people, the Hebrews, who nobody knows where they went to? They're all gone. Nobody can point out a Hebrew anymore. But the Hebrews, according to the new churches, we know who the Hebrews are. But according to the, uh, the Bible, if we go through the genealogies, we're not going to do that. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Hebrews are those of Eber. That would be Noah. Here's a refresher for you. Noah, Shem, his son. Skip a few. Eber. Skip six more. Abraham. 
And then God chose who? Son of promise. Isaac. And then, of course, Isaac. Then God chose Jacob. And then, of course, Jacob's sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. So the chosen progeny of the Hebrews are the Israel people. Now, they have a token that we haven't yet mentioned. The Hebrews do. Number 17. Number 17, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod, according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod for Levi, for one rod shall be the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them in the tabernacle of congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each prince one, according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness, and it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witnesses, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds." And Moses brought up all the rods out from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. Now that's some weird stuff. So what happened? The budding almond rod, of course, is symbolic of Christ's priestly authority as we go on. This also reaffirmed Aaron's position as high priest within Levi. And what was going on is there was a little bit of argument about what was so special about Aaron and his kind that they were made high priest and nobody else was. So God said, well, I'm going to do this, and whichever rod blossoms, that's my chosen priesthood, which is what exactly what happened. And then, of course, here the effect was to quite take away their murmurings. So, interestingly enough, the, among other things, like the manna, or the golden pot that held the manna, uh, the law books, and the rod of Aaron, they were placed in the Ark of the Testimony. A second witness is found in Hebrews 9, which we were just there. Hebrews 9, 4 says, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So that's exactly what we just said. There's a second witness. That's New Testament theology. So the budding almond rod, or Israel's high priest, going along with them is a token of God's people. It's known as one of the many marks of Israel, by the way. Now, what was the rod's function according to 17.10? For a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away the murmurings from me that they die not. So, if this is symbolic of Christ, then Christ was to take away sin so that we do not die. Right? Is that not what Christ did for us? Who? Well, men and women of Israel, his kingdom of priests and kings. We'll cover the Ark of the Covenant later in this series because it's very important what else is in that covenant, when it will be found, and what happens when it's opened. But uh, you may say, well, Pastor Reed, that's all well and good. That's interesting. There's an almond rod in the Ark, but that was lost when Babylon came and got us. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Nobody has that rod. Well, Jeremiah saw it, so let's see what he has to say. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said unto me, Thou hast, seen, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. So you see, the almond rod here, the almond here represents watchfulness. God's watchfulness over his law. Every time we see people preaching and teaching the obeyance and upholding of God's law, we see the almond rod which points us to Christ. Does it bud? 
Does the omen rod now? We have but. Well, back to Matthew 7. We'll have to see. Matthew 7, budding. 15. Beware of false prophets which are come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, or almonds, or blossoms. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So the fruit of God's almond tree is what? His children obeying his law in its entirety. That's how we bear the fruits. That's how we show what it is the almond tree is to us, where it is. And of course, it's a second witness to Israel. We'll talk about that later with the Ark of the Covenant. So as his priests were to do his law or bear the fruits of righteousness for our king and his kingdom. And of course, we're to teach others to do so. It is a sweet thing to the Lord, a sweet song, a sweet song to both us and himself. Zephaniah, we'll go there quickly to see what this song is. I promise all this will make perfect sense by the time you get to the end of this sermon series. Zephaniah, so it would be Zephaniah chapter 2. Verse 16 and 17. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let thine hands not be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. He is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, and he will joy over thee with singing. Now that's very, very important. We'll get to that later in this series. So God sings over his people. Who have what? Well, bared faith and allegiance unto him. Can women do this? Yes. Can they agree to obey God and pledge their life and work to him? Yes. Can they show physically and publicly that they made an oath to him? Yes. Can they be circumcised? Yes. Can they bear the token of a nation who are made up of God's priests and kings? Yes. Now, the oath for enlist enlistment that we read earlier, it mentioned following orders over those appointed over you. If officers is what it called that, if you recall. In terms of the biblical definition of woman, whom has God appointed over her then? Her husband, then Christ. Can a woman then be an officer no. Can they be appointed to a position that God reserves for men only? Never. Never. What is God's officer's position? Well, that's bishops or pastors. And who are they? Well, they're heads of the church. That's simply God's chain of command. That's all there is to it. Yet since they cannot be a pastor biblically, are women still in the chain of command? Yes. Do they still have a job to do? Yes. Does this apply to men as well? Yes. Since George over there isn't a pastor, does that release him from duty? Is he free from all the responsibilities of that of a Christian man, husband, and father? No. Even if he claims to be a pastor or officer, does that actually make him one? No. Does impersonating a pastor and then preaching to people without the anointing carry severe consequences in God's eyes? Yes. If a woman says she's a pastor, does that actually make her one? No. Can she be a pastor and still be within God's order? No. Even if a man ordains a woman, is she actually an anointed head of the church as far as God's concerned? No. Is this, accordance to, is this in accord with the Scripture? No. When this happens, and it does, is God's order, which is outlined in the Scripture, is, God or, is God's order suddenly altered? Does His mind change to make room for that man or that woman's actions? No. My Bible says God changes not. 
The same applies to God's order in the home as well, if you think about it. If a woman comes up and says, well, I'm the head of my home, does that make her in line with God, and does that actually make her the head of the home? No, it does not. She can try to be, to great personal loss to herself and her family, of course. But women, as part of the nation of God's people, Israel, have a large part to play in a getting us all to the kingdom, do they not? I hope they do. I really do. Because otherwise, all the work is on us, on our men's shoulders, right? If they don't have no part to play, and of course, they're not much of a help meet if they cannot or will not share the load. God wasted his time giving us Eve if she's to just sit down and be quiet. What a waste of time. If it was all us men that's going to get the job done anyway, And besides all that, if you want to have all the work be done by yourself, well, what it is, you're seeking glory. My Bible says in the end of the age, God alone will get the glory, not Adam or Eve. Now, the word preach and prophecy get thrown around an awful lot when this subject is discussed, and we will cover those in the next sermon. Amount of time, I see. We'll cover this, uh, we'll also cover this prayer, uh, teaching, learning, prophesy, and the authority issue as well. So that's next week, and this is where it's really going to get ugly because I'm going to have to start getting some definitions, and we're going to have to straighten out a lot of people's theologies. But before I get emails and messages, phone calls, texts, comments, letters from you, you telling me I've forgotten all about Deborah the prophetess and all about Holda the prophetess and how Deborah was a judge and Miriam and how much she sang, I assure you I haven't. We will cover those next week. So just hang on. Don't jump the gun. By now I'm sure you know I cannot cover this Bible in its entirety in 60 minutes. So Pastor Reed hasn't forgotten those. I know what I'm doing. I'm sure by now you know there's a lot more to come. So don't jump the gun. For the benefit of my critics, keyboard warriors, and survey takers, I say this. Listen to this series in its entirety before being quick to judge or the laying on of hands. That's all we have. We'll end in prayer.